You're listening to Art Affairs, episode number 11. Today I'll be talking to Troy Brooks. So my name's Michael Faith, and this is Art Affairs. If this is your first time listening, Art Affairs is meant to give you a look at and into the new contemporary art community, featuring conversations with artists, gallerists, curators, shining a spotlight on the human side of the wonderful work they do. You can dig through previous episodes complete with show notes at artaffairspodcast.com, and you can check out new episodes on all your favorite podcast platforms. Of course, if you like what I'm doing here, be sure to subscribe and share it with your friends. It really helps get the word out. You can always connect with the show on Instagram and Facebook at Art Affairs Podcast. On Twitter, it's at art underscore affairs. All right, so today's guest is surrealist painter Troy Brooks. Troy's artwork is so interesting, and his style is incredibly unique. The subjects of his work uh, for pretty much his entire career have been strong and elegant women, always seemingly in a position of power. We talk about the story behind these women of Troy, as he calls them, as well as Troy's own origin story, and his early infatuation with old Hollywood and film noir. We also talk a bit about his process, his new studio called The Vault, his upcoming solo show at Corey Helford Gallery, and so much more. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with Troy Brooks. Troy, welcome to the show, man. It's great to have you on. Thank you. Nice to be here. All right. So let's talk a little bit about your background. And from what I read, you were born in Chatham, Ontario, which according to the Google Maps, is right across the U.S.-Canadian border from Detroit, fairly close. Um, was that where you spent most of your childhood? Um, I, well, I did uh, spend till about grade three, and then we moved to Florida. Mm. My dad had a thing about Florida, so we kept moving back and forth to Florida. So I spent a, a good deal amount of time actually in the States. And um, then about grade seven, we came back. So I, I, if I would have stayed there, I was going to school. I could have just kind of slipped into being a citizen. But What was your father's obsession with Florida? That's an interesting one. <laughs> well, he just loved the ocean. Okay. He was a big, he, he, he just has always loved the water. So what was the area like that you spent most of your childhood? Was it rural? Was it uh, more of a small town? Um, small town in, um, uh, in Canada, for sure. And then, uh, then Florida was more like, I mean, it was like a beach. Mm. It was so night and day, right? Because we went from from cold weather and small town to this, you know, I mean, Florida, we lived in, in West Palm Beach. It's oh, wow. quite a contrast. Yeah. So, but a beautiful place to, to, you know, be young. I mean, it was going to the beach all the time. It was fantastic. You know, Canada felt so dark and cold. I mean, I love Canada. I'm so glad that I, I ended up here, but it, I, I sometimes long for palm trees you know that's makes me the happy memories of palm trees for sure now now from what i've read um you did have a rather difficult childhood um and if, if you're comfortable talking about that uh yeah sure i I'm, I'm curious what were some of the challenges that that you had to deal with well you know for for whatever reason I, uh you know i think i inherited it from my mother actually she had uh uh it, it's 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 Everybody talks about anxiety now, and everybody talks about medication and stuff. I was, I've never been on medication, but my mother really had anxiety issues. It, it actually runs in my family. My sister has major, she used to have panic attacks uh, um, where she would have to be carried out on a stretcher. Wow. I mean, I have, I have memories of her, and nobody really talked about it. All of a sudden, you would, I would just see her being carried away in an ambulance just because she had a panic attack and froze. I used to have that. But for whatever reason, I managed to cope with it somehow. 
And um, I mean, I always pushed myself in, 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 into situations that um, were scary because I was so scared of being afraid. Um, that's kind of interesting when I think about it now. I mean, I, you know, when I think about the things I used to do to kind of uh, um, throw myself into scary situations because I was very ambitious as a kid. I had a lot of dreams and I was really scared that that anxiety and that fear would, would stop me from pursuing those things that I wanted. So, I mean, I, I think I, I used to, you know, being in front of people terrified me, terrified me. And I had a teacher in school that used to, um, uh, I thought it was a good idea, and, and it was a good idea, to get everyone to come up individually before class started and give a speech or sing the national anthem or recite a poem. And I was, I was like one of the only white kids in the school and painfully awkward. Everybody else was so cool and, you know, just together. And I was just a complete, stuck out like a sore thumb. So, um, you know, of course I would go up and just be, uh, torn apart as soon as the, all the kids were alone during recess. And I mean, you know, uh, I, I like to draw and I, I, I was very introspective and just super awkward. So, you know, I, I, there are things that, that, that were done to me that, you know, it would make your hair curl um, back in, cool, in school. Like I have, I, 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 I've talked about it before. I have a, this memory where I was in Florida and um, these two kids that I knew uh, that I was actually really good friends with came over and, um, you know, asked me to go play. We went to play. I had a phobia of frogs mm. and they took me to this, like a real phobia. I don't know where it comes from. It's so irrational, but I would just freak out at the mention of, or at, 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 if there was a frog around me, it, 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 for some reason, it really just freaked me out. So they took me to this uh, little sort of plywood shed that they had built next to this construction site in the woods. And they tied me to a lawn chair. And I just got played along at first because I thought, well, it's just a, you know, whatever. What age were you at this point? I was in grade four or five. Okay. Um, so uh, they tied me to this lawn chair. They put a sack over my head and, and, and dumped a bunch of toads into the sack in my head. So, I mean, I, there are so many things that tr try. I mean, I just have this memory of not being able to scream because I was afraid that those frogs would go in my mouth. Ugh. Just unbelievable you know i had really really sadistic friends <laughs> you know and i was just so happy to have any friends at all i was like okay well you know this is what what happens wow if your friends are that way then what are your enemies like <laughs> right yeah well you know i think I, I was the natural sort of target because you know it was really hard to hide the fact that i was a i was a step different than everybody i was at a step and kids zero in on anything different i mean if they, they, they the kids will zero in ex like right on your sensitive part you know they'll they'll it, it's so funny that it's like they smell fear like horses you know do you feel that that experience in some way contributed to you becoming an artist as maybe a form of escape well it was always a form of escape you know i mean art was something that i, I mean i was drawing before i could speak I was drawing, um, you know, my earliest memories are of me and my mom. She was a sort of a watercolorist, you know, um, she had a bit, she was a very special creative person that I feel really didn't, uh, never really fully tapped into her creative side because she was so busy being a, a wife and a mother. Um, but she had so much energy. She would, um, was always doing a creative project. And so I just happened to be born around the time when she was really into painting watercolors. So I would just kind of sit by her and, and, and I'll never forget. I mean, I still to this day, I, you know, remember giggling beside her and, and it was uncontrolled. But I remember when I was little, I was thinking, I don't want her to think that I'm laughing at her, but I, it was involuntary. I was so thrilled by what she was doing. I would just laugh hysterically. And I tried to emulate it, you know, and I would, I would ask her to draw a picture of Wonder Woman for me and she would just start doing the eyes and it was very rudimentary, you know, she would just draw these little eyelashes and I just flipped out. I thought it was the coolest thing. That's amazing. So, you know, 
us watching old movies together in the afternoon when I was really, really, really little, and me trying to draw the women in those movies, which is basically the same exact thing I'm doing right now. Yeah, that's incredible. So yeah, tell me a little bit about that artwork. Was it the same type of style where you, where you have women in sort of, you know, positions of power doing remarkable things or was it totally different? Well, I always, I always drew women, always. Um, I, and it was something I, I never really thought about. Um, you know, when I had to do my first show, you know, obviously you've got to write an artist statement. I have no education in art at all. So I was, I, I didn't really have the, the vocabulary or, I mean, it is a language, you know, art speak. It's almost impossible not to sound pretentious when you're writing an artist statement. But, you know, I, I was forced to do this for my first show. Why are you painting women? What are you trying to say? What's this? And, you know, when you've been doing something since you were little, since before you could communicate things, it's like asking why do you why do you breathe? You know why why do you like that color? Well, I don't know. It's but it really forced me to sit down and and think about it because obviously it served a function. You know, it was for a reason because there's got to be some kind of reason why I am drawn to this subject it, to the exclusion of everything else. And I really thought deeply about it. I meditated on that a lot, and I came up with you you, you can't divorce the fact that I paint women and I'm a gay guy that came of age in, in at a time in the 70s and 80s when you know being gay was it was really not discussed you know it was really an unmentionable thing so when you don't have a vocabulary for something or you don't have the the language for it it sort of it, it finds a way you know to be expressed somehow so you know I, i've come to realize that you know back then when when i would try to express that part of myself that, you know, little boys weren't supposed to express or have, you know, any kind of feminine thing. Like if I wanted to paint my fingernails or if I wanted to play with dolls, which was always a thing with me growing up, you were made to feel humiliated, you know, in, in essence, what, you know, and, and what that says about how we feel about women in general. Like, I mean, you can't not think about that. I mean, why is it so humiliating for a little boy to do things that the girls are doing, right. you know, but it's not humiliating the other way around. So I, I really thought about that. And, you know, um, ultimately what the women in my work, what they do, even since I was a little boy is they, they demand respect, right? So they take all of the humiliating feelings that I have about that part of myself and they command reverence you know, and they, they fill that space that, that I couldn't back then, you know, so it does serve a function. These, these women, they tell my stories, but they tell them from a place of, um, power. That's amazing. Um, and also clearly you've, you've heavily influenced by old like Hollywood movies. And you mentioned that earlier that you would watch old movies with your mother and you would pour over like old Hollywood photographs in the library. What attracted you to old film? Was it more your mother's interest and that carried over to you? No, I had a really intrinsic sort of um, just it was it was very very visceral because those women in those in those in those movies they were just a very specific kind of um, androgyny where you know they square shouldered they had very clipped mouths and they were severe you know they were they were an interesting sort of combination of man and woman right and that that really didn't exist before you know you didn't really see that in any point in history where women were starting to dress like men it was right after you know uh right just right around the second world war where women were wearing very tailored suits and and women's pictures came into the public vogue and uh you know you saw people like betty davis and barbara stanwyck and joan crawford that were kind of terrified all the men in those movies they dominated uh, film around that time. And I just always loved that. I mean, there's something really satisfying about Betty Davis walking into a room and scaring the shit out of all the men in the room. <laughs> there, there, it, it, you know, and that, what I was saying before, it's like, and so many gay men respond to that, you know, it's because it's validation. It really is validation. You know, you want to see a woman who's commanding the space and she's, 
very feminine still. You know, she's, she dresses great. She's got lots of makeup on. And she's, you know, there's a reason why drag queens always do those women. Because they're almost a caricature of a woman. When you've been denied something for a really, really long time, you want an exaggerated version of it. Sure. Right? Yeah, that makes sense. And I always say I'm a, I'm a frustrated drag queen. At the end of the day, that's really, I, I, that's really what my paintings, I'm just kind of like dressing up in drag. It just feels sometimes, you know, at the end of the day. What, what about like artists that influenced you early on? Did you have any, um, you know, influential artists when you were growing up? Well, you know what is, is, is funny is I always loved the art that I really couldn't seem to emulate. Like my favorite painters were Renoir and, and I loved, uh, oh, I loved Paul Delaroche. I love the impressionist painters, but I couldn't ever do that because it's my natural sort of uh, inclination to detail, detail, detail. I, it, and I try to do, I've tried, I should try it again. I would love to see if, if I could pull it off after all these years, but I loved those painters because, and I, and later on I realized why is because, you know, they're, they're really painting light, you know, and that's what I try to do because my work really took a turn when I realized, okay, why it's the painters that I always respond to. It's really the painters that are painting light, you know, when the, when the detail goes away and it's an impressionist painting you're really responding to the light because that's the star of the show in impressionist painting is the light, right? Right. So um, once I started focusing on 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 that, and that's b- basically my training because, you know, all those old movies from the 40s and 30s, they're really painting with light. And the, you, you really just can't get any any better with lighting as those that, that kind of classic film, right? Because they told the story. All those movies with, with Joan Crawford where there's one like shadow over one eye, those lighting setups are so detailed and so brilliant. And it conveys a story, that shadow over, like if Joan Crawford was, was in trouble in a movie, if she was hiding something or if she had uh, something that she, that she couldn't say, there was always a shadow over one eye. Mm. And I love that, you know, it's like this burden, you know. That's amazing. Um, and at some point early on, and I'm not sure what age you were doing this, but you were doing commissions of like family portraits for people in your neighborhood. Um, and, and it sounded like from what I read that you absolutely hated it and that yeah. it, it kind of discouraged you from initially starting to pursue a career in art. Oh, yeah. um, tell me more about that. How did you get involved doing these portraits? Well, I mean, I, had a, I, I guess I had a natural um, technical ability early on. And I just got kind of drafted into doing these, these commission portraits, which I hated. And it turned me off art. I mean, it really did. It's one of the reasons why I didn't go into art um, after high school, because my parents were like, go to art school, we'll pay for it. And I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. You know, it's so <laughs> backwards, right? It was like, I had a friend that was like, I, I, I think it's hysterical that your, fr- your, your parents are begging you to go to art school. And you're like, no, I don't want to do it. So, um, but I just had this notion in my head of, you know, being uh, alone all the time, which when I was in my 20s, you know, terrified me. I'm basically a, a, a social person, even though I've got my anxieties. And I need, I like to be around people. Um, and it, it seemed like, well, that's, it's going to be a life of, um, of poverty. I had the whole Van Gogh notion in my head. I don't want to, you know, do all this work and only get, sort of any kind of recognition, maybe after I'm dead, you know. But it turned out that I had a lot of misconceptions about the art world and the industry. But it wasn't until I saw um, a a painting by Lori Early, and then later on, Ray Caesar, that I thought, okay, well, because I I thought when I first started pursuing a career in art, I thought, well, no one's going to be interested in my women. You know, that's, I don't see that anywhere. I don't see that as a genre. So I tried to, you know, I tried to paint landscapes. I tried to do, uh, you know, abstract. I, I tried to be Jean-Michel Basquiat. I mean, I tried everything in the world. You, and I could not get arrested. I could not get anyone interested. And, and as soon as I saw that Lori Early painting, it was in a friend's studio. He had a big print. Um, I thought, well, okay, you know what? I, I'm just going to try this because I remember my sister came over to my studio one time and she looked at, around at all the paintings and she said, what is all this mucky muck 
<laughs> artsy shit that you're doing right now. What happened to your women? That's your, that's your thing. That's what you do. And I was so irritated when she told me that. But she was right. You know, she was absolutely right. So I just thought, well, for better or worse, you know, if I'm going to fail, I'd rather fail at doing something that comes perfectly natural and that is absolutely without a doubt coming from me. So, and then I got a show without even trying. It was so serendipitous. Um, someone happened to see one of my paintings. A friend of mine took me to uh, um, a gallery just as a, he was trying to show at this gallery. He took me, he's like, you should, really should meet the, uh, the, the, the gallery owner. I did. And he saw my work and I, without even sending work to anyone, I got a show without even trying. So I just thought, well, that just goes to show you, right? Yeah. You got to follow your instinct. You just have, you really can't second guess what the public is going to accept or, you know, what you think is going to make an impression. Because even if you're the smartest person in the world, you'll never be as, as smart as whatever muses you have, you know, circling you. Well, and it probably wouldn't feel as, as fulfilling. Oh, I can't imagine if I'd started out and if I had any kind of success doing any of those, that, those paintings that I was doing before, God, I would be so empty. So since you didn't go to art school, what did you, uh, you know, first start to do before you got into art again? Well, I was a musician for years um, and I, I played all around Toronto and stuff. And it was, I mean, it was fun. I was really into the songwriting and I, I taught myself guitar and, and I played all around and, and, you know, like locally. And I guess... I didn't have my act together at that point and my heart really wasn't in it. And it wasn't until I started painting that I thought, okay, this feels completely natural. I know I took a long break from art and when I got back into it, you know, I was like in my thirties and I felt, I thought to myself, okay, do I really want to shift my whole um, direction in life at this late date? How this is, I'm, I basically will be a waiter forever now. You know, I'm, I'm cementing this. <laughs> Thank God that didn't end up happening. But I, I think to myself, you know, because I was having dinner with um, some people, like just sort of a few years after I'd really started to gain some traction in the art world, which is insane. That's amazing, right? Yeah. And I'll never, I'll never not be grateful for that. I was having dinner with these people and, and, and I was talking to some guy who was an uh, investment broker or something. And he said, you know, I, I, I really wanted to go into art. And then I thought to myself at the last minute, what are you doing? It's like winning the lottery, being able to have a career in art. And I thought, you know, you're absolutely right. It is like winning the lottery. And it was like, you know, I, I'm always very grateful because I didn't get any success until later on in life, right? But it was just a, a very powerful kind of reminder in that moment. Like, yes, you've won the lottery. You have an audience. You have a successful career in, in a field that is very, very difficult to get your footing in. So I just feel so grateful for that. Without any formal training um, in the arts, how did you go about learning to paint and, and perfecting your style? It was, well, I always say it's, it was the most expensive on the job training that <laughs> I, you could ever imagine because, you know, obviously it's very expensive and, and paint, oil paint is such an alchemy. It took me a while to figure out the alchemy of it because, you know, the whole fat over lean, you certain colors, like the earth colors dry so much faster than, you know, the reds or whatever. And if it dries close together, then it cracks. And you just have to be really conscious of what colors, uh, how they interact with other colors. And, and then, you know, obviously I, it took me a long time to learn about color and the marriage of certain colors, what colors bounce off each other, you know, beautifully and what other colors just... When I first started, I, I remember looking at some older paintings that, you know, I, I just think, my God, it's just like the primary colors get, it's just like, it's like a eye rape, you know, it's so <laughs> horrible. But, you know, it, it took me a long time to, to learn the subtleties of how colors go together and stuff. And, so was it all experimentation or did you oh, have yeah. any resources to, to read no. or watch videos or? Oh God, no, that was way before. I mean, I, I sort of found myself in in like what i wanted to do way before i had any kind of computer fluency in retrospect do you think you would have benefited from a formal arts training or do you feel like sort of self-experimentation actually helped you more well i mean it's a kind of it, it, both 
the reason the faces in my paintings are so long is because I just had, for some reason, always made my faces too long. Now, if I had gone to art school they, or, or any, had any kind of training, they would have corrected that, I'm sure. So a lot of, you know, I just think it's so funny when people talk about, oh, I love your style. Are you like Modigliani? Is, is he like an influence? And I, <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I would love to be able to say yes, but the truth is it's just a, a function of, of my bad proportion. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I always made my face too long and I always went back and fixed it. And then one day I just decided to stop fixing it and accentuate it, you know, and now I've pulled it back a little bit. What helped you come to that realization to, to finally embrace that uniqueness about your style? I don't know what it, what it was. I just, it just clicked one day, like, um, stop, stop fixing it and see what, because, you know, I, I love the Mannerist uh, painters, you know, and how they always kind of like those, those British portrait artists, there was always a little bit of elongation. And I don't know. I mean, I just, I, I guess after I decided, okay, you want to paint women, paint women it kind of opened the floodgates to just, okay, well, if down, as long as you're down this road of just doing what, com what comes completely natural, why don't you let the faces be long too? You know what I mean? So it was just, just a, the current started gathering. Uh, another distinctive aspect of, of your style is your use of lighting, which we talked a lot about earlier in, as far as Hollywood movies go. Is that where that, that all comes from? Yes. Well, definitely. Because I mean, I learned to draw from I mean, some of those photographers like uh, uh, George Harrell, which I think was one of the most brilliant portrait photographers ever in the history of, of, of photography. And Edward Steichen and, and um, Cecil Beaton. I mean, there's uh, Ruth Harriet, Louise, Clarence Sinclair Bull. There's so many. I, I learned to draw from those photographers, those classic Hollywood photographers. And Arnold Gente, you know, like beautiful, beautiful portraits of Greta Garbo um, before she really broke. Um, yeah, the lighting was, was, was magnificent and, and I mean, very dramatic. And as I said, it told a story. So, you know, not only did I learn about lighting, but you know, those, those old movies, I mean, every frame, the composition, you can only do a film like that in a very, very controlled studio environment. Right. For sure. Yeah. And you know, the, 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 the level of detail for those setups of course, it's it's it, it's it's so intrinsically woven into my work. I for a while I couldn't even do a, a drawing or a painting without it looking a little bit like either Marlena Dietrich or Greta Garbo or or Joan Crawford. I mean, they, the, the, those women are just kind of completely. Um, they're like the uh, the foundation of all my work, you know. So it's it, it's not something I do consciously everything has a kind of weird vintage retro vibe to what i do yeah and and how much identity do these characters have for you do you have do they make return appearances or is it more just about telling the story that you want to tell at that point well you know the thing is i always used to i used to say i get a little disappointed when i'm at a show and somebody will think they're giving me a compliment when they say oh, this looks just like lady gaga and i just want to shoot myself <laughs> in the face because you know, no disrespect to Lady Gaga, but I want these to be um, the, the, like a narrative. I don't want it to be a likeness. So I, I work very hard to try and erase any kind of um, distinguishing feature in a face. Like I want it to be very straight and 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 not. It, it's hard because my natural desire to put detail in there, I have to stop myself. Because I don't want to make it photorealism. I, I mean, that, you know, hats off to you know, the photorealism artists, but that's not what I am interested in. I don't want to do that. Like the art that I love, there's a um, there's a there's a uh, an interpretation, a painterly interpretation. Like uh, one of my favorite painters is Lisa Yuskevich. You know, um, her paintings of women sort of in dappled lighting and, and sun drenched rooms. And you, it almost looks like one, like those, um, old erotic illustrations you would see in, in Playboy, you know, but very done, very painterly. Um, I want to see an interpretation. So, but I also, I don't want to see a likeness in my paintings cause it's not a portrait. It's like a diary entry. It's a story. I want it to tell a story. So sometimes I fall a little short of that and they end up looking like somebody, but you can't help that. You know, what are you going to do? 
you you use a lot of uh, visual metaphor and and sort of rich characterization. Are, are you still using these um, pieces that you work on to tell a story about yourself, like you did as a kid, or are these new stories that you're you're telling? Well, you know, it's funny. It's completely instinctual, and I, I always say um, metaphors in my work happen very uh, intuitively it, because if I tried to tell a story or if I tried to impose something on a piece of art, it always comes out flat. So when there's a metaphor that happens, like there's a lot of animals in my work, that was not intentional. It just, it just whatever feels visually satisfying and correct, there's always a reason that I'll, I, I can suss out usually like later on down the road. But in the moment, it just feels satisfying. That's all I can say is that it's correct and it's satisfying. But then a year or two later, I'll look at that painting and I'll be like, okay, you know, it seems crazy that I wouldn't have made that connection in the moment. But, you know, I think that's how intuition works. You know, when you really tap into, as an artist, when you tap into your, whatever it is, your source or your muse or whatever, it's so much smarter than you could ever hope to be. You know, you can fit a thousand points of information on the head of a pin in a moment, you know, if you're really working from intuition. Um, and so that's what I try to do. And it's so, so funny, like lately I, I, I get so irritated with, there's a lot of um, artists, musicians, artists all over the place that keep talking about um, artists are here to disturb the peace and they're here to, you know, speak truth to power. And it's like, it makes me so, it just grosses me out because that art that they're talking about is always one dimensional. It has to be because you're imposing some kind of prefab social agenda on it. You're not working from instinct. You're trying to, you know, it's a big blow horn. The amount of art in art history that has been oppositional, that has, this, you know, speaks truth to power. It's like this much, this much. And when I hear people saying art is here, your art is here to amuse. The end. It might uh, be a, a, a part of a social change. It might do that, but it, that can't be the motive of art. So, are are these stories still about yourself and your own experiences? I mean, sort of like a self portrait. Yes. No, I said I went off on, on a tangent there. Sorry. Yeah. No, they they are um, uh, they are my stories. But as I said before, it's it's because it's so I I intuitive. Um, I, I honestly, I, I I don't know consciously what I'm doing until it's over. For instance, I remember uh, there was one painting I did years ago, and this is just, I had broken up with somebody and I was in between apartments. My, my art, I was just about to do my second solo show. And I just had big success with my first show. And I thought, wow, I could actually, you know, not get a job doing anything. I could actually do this uh, not get a job doing anything that came out wrong, <laughs> but I mean, like I could, I could do this full time. I mean, this, don't get me wrong. Art is like, I mean, I, you know, I'm working on a, on a solo show right now for, uh, um, August, uh, solo show in, in LA. And it's like, it, you, you have to do it to the exclusion of everything else. Like I have no life when I'm working on a, on a series. It's basically you're, you have the life of a monk. You get up early morning, you paint all day long, and then you go to bed and then start again seven days a week. Anyway, so I had just uh, had my first show and I had to go and live with my parents for a few months because I had nowhere to stay and, and, you know, I hadn't really gotten my footing in the art world yet. So, you know, here I am. God, I, I don't think I was quite 40, but I was living with my, in the basement of my parents' house and I was just mortified. And so I painted this show, Colossus. And for some stupid reason, I decided, well, yeah, this is a good idea to, to do a, a series about Sylvia Plath poems. So I'm broken up. My life is, feels like it's over. And I'm doing all these paintings about loss and suicide. It was, <laughs> it was bleak. It was super bleak. But anyway, one of those paintings turned out to be, there was like a, um, a glass of alcohol sort of turned over. Um, she was in a prison cell there was a bird flying off out of the cell into the corner. There was a wasp's nest, all these, it was really like steeped, heavy, heavy steeped in symbolism. And I just thought it looked cool. And then later on, 
you know, a few months down the, the, the road, and I'm, I'm kind of, you know, putting all these paintings together and I'm trying to formulate how to talk about them at the, at the opening. And because it's all very ephemeral. And then you have, then I, I, spend, I spend days talking to myself before the opening, trying to find how to talk about them, right? Right, yeah. Because um, people want to know. And you, ha- you can't just show up at, a, a, at an opening and just say, well, you know, <laughs> this is visually satisfying. I have, to have, I have to know what I'm talking about. And it catch up to my instincts so that I have the words. And I was looking at that painting, I'm thinking, oh my God, that is, that is the last five months of my life. I was in a basement, prison cell. I had stopped drinking. I, I, I was like a monk. I was just, no, I don't have a drinking problem, but I just thought to get this show finished and to, to paint for these long hours, I can't do anything but take care of myself and live on the straight and narrow you know, for these five months stopped drinking, drink turned over. And that was also like any kind of addiction that I may have dabbled in whatever. I mean, I was, I was completely giving everything up. And there was also a, a gun with, that was stuck in a toilet and it was the whole floor was filled with roses. It was a completely crazy painting. But I thought that that's exactly sums up the summer that I was living, right? As rich as these stories are um, and as, as much depth as they have, um, have you ever considered writing like writing stories about these characters, maybe to accompany the paintings or even sort of as a standalone work? I should. I mean, I, I, I've thought about that. Um, one day when I, when I make a book, I had a show, I, I, I had a few um, pieces in a show in Paris this past or last year. And I was approached by um, a book publisher to maybe in the future do, do a book because I've self-published a few art books but I mean, very, very, very small presses. They were very expensive and, and you know, sold out of those. But I would like to do like a, a, a definitive kind of um, retrospective of my work. But it just seems so daunting because I would need the text to go with it. And, you know, there's so much stuff that would, I, I would need to formulate. But I would like to. I, I think that would be well received, but I could see how that would be a ton of work to do to put all yeah. of that together. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk a bit about the mediums you work in. So, you know, pretty much all of your, your big gallery shows, it's all oil on canvas. Um, w- what is it about oil that you like so much? Well, the blending. I, because I like, I like there to be a very uh, hazy kind of sleek, blended uh, look. And with oil, I, I, don't, I mean, I know that um, you can do that with acrylic. And I don't believe that acrylic is any less vibrant than oil paint. I've seen beautiful acrylic painters who do incredible work and it's very vibrant and wonderful. But um, I just like to blend too much, I think, to, to, to do. I, I tried acrylic one time. I remember I, I applied for this gig where this is be- before I really was, was um, doing exhibitions. And it was a gig to paint people's portraits live at funerals and bar mitzvahs and weddings and stuff. Wow. And so the guy had artists come in and it it was a six hour turnaround. So first artist would come in at eight o'clock in the morning. And then six hours later, the next artist would come in and that that they would all paint the same portrait of this, of this guy. So he had like 12 portraits of this guy against (laughs) the wall. And I was looking, and I remember when I finished mine, he's like, wow. And it was in acrylic. It was an acrylic, right? And I had never painted in acrylic, but I managed to do it for, by some crazy, strange, you know, uh, uh, whatever. I managed to do it. And he's like, wow, yours looks so much prettier than the other ones. <laughs> it was, I mean, you know, it was this like young Indian guy and, and I made him look like, I don't know, some movie star. That's amazing. What, what does your process typically involve? Uh, do, you, do you do a lot of sketching and composition work ahead of time or do you sort of just go in and start painting? What I like to do is, is um, I try, I, I see sketching makes it so much easier. I try to sketch as, mu- as much as I can um, in, in, in on the canvas or on the, um, the panel. But oftentimes, it, you know, the paintings take such a, such a left turn. It's hard to, it's, it, it, it's very unpredictable. So, so you pretty much kind of go with the flow and, and your paintings become a completely new thing that you hadn't really anticipated yeah like i'll I'll be having something drawn on the surface and then halfway through 
I'll realize, well, no, there needs to be a wall here or there need the, the, the balance is thrown off. This needs to be over here. And I mean, it's just a mess. I, 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 I would like to say I plan it out perfectly before putting paint on, but that's so not true. And I, I mean, I've been, I, I, I remember one time there was this painting that I did and I've told this story before, but um, it was the painting Exodus. And it's a, it's a larger painting of a woman with a bunch of red butterflies flying out of a suitcase, right? And I had painted this right after I finished a contract with a gallery. It was a three-year contract. And I felt like, oh, this is a new beginning. And, you know, and then this, I did this painting um, and it was so personified kind of what headspace I was in, you know. And all these butterflies coming out, there's a spotlight on the woman. And I thought, well, oh, shit, I'm going to have to do shadows behind all these butterflies. <laughs> and I thought, oh, God. So I started doing that. And then I realized, wrong move. It, it might it might make the painting look more realistic, but now it looks like complete chaos. So I had to paint around. I didn't want to repaint the woman because I, I felt like I had done her so great and I can, never, I can never really repeat that. So I had to paint around all those butterflies and all that woman. And, it, and, and not only that, but do a perfect spotlight circle blended in around the, all those butterflies it was a nightmare and i i swear to god i almost threw that painting away <laughs> it was just like i can't bear this it's brutal do you see an evolution in your style over the years do you see that your style's changed even slightly as, as you've sort of improved and and gotten to know it better yeah oh yeah absolutely i mean geez i look back at some of my older pieces and i just think oh you know it's so i mean i see what i was trying to do i was there was still a sense that I was trying to be like a little bit like the painters that I had seen, you know, like once I saw Lori Early and, and, and Ray Caesar, I, I think I was still clinging to that a little bit. You know, now I really feel like I, I'm doing uh, what I should be doing. And it's, it's definitely taken more root in and I trust my instincts more. And now it's more my influences and, and not quite, you know, I, there's, there's a lot of in the early paintings, there was a sort of a gothic kind of very overtly gothic, you know, like women holding lambs and, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, very satanic looking women. And I love, you know, I, I, I still love that kind of stuff. But I, I think my work now, there, there's a lot, there's more subtlety to it, I think. Yeah. In addition to oil paintings, um, you, you've also done several colored pencil pieces. Um, yes. And I'm absolutely blown away by your colored pencils, by the way. You know what's interesting? Those colored pencil uh, uh, things that I did on Instagram, I mean, I got so many shares and so much traction from those colored pencil posts. I, it's unbelievable. Like I, I had one that, that, that went viral. There was like 150,000 um, views, views of me just doing this little head, you know, on a pencil, a colored pencil. I'm like, what? You know? <laughs> But I think it's because I think it's because um, people expect to see that kind of uh, uh, thing in with oil paint. But when they see it's a colored pencil, and, and you know, there's something when you work on colored paper or paper that's toned, you can really get a great sort of uh, a sense of light. You know, you work with lighter colors and stuff. And and you know, I did this. There was this one colored pencil drawing I did on black paper. Well, there was a few, but there was one in in particular. Uh, that was it was a, a silhouette of somebody. It was called the funeral singer, and there was a um, just smoke coming out of the mouth, and it was lit from behind. So there was all this light coming from um, a very very you know small source, and it was very silhouette. And that piece got so many uh, so much reaction, and I think a lot of people thought that the um, the surface that I was doing it on was lit from underneath. Which I thought was so funny, but you know, it's like a, a a little bit of a trick of the eye, I guess. You know, like people really responded to that. Do you feel like your experience as an oil painter uh, translates over to color pencils? Like, are, are there similarities in your approach? Well, I, I mean, I you know, painting has always been a struggle for me. Drawing is something that I mean, it's like it's like talking. I mean, it's so natural to me. So when I when I found out that there were colored pencils that they were making, you know, Karen 
dash luminance makes a very light fast. Like these, these colored pencils don't fade with sun. I mean, most of the colored pencil uh, that, that, that I used to know about, like when I was in high school, like Laurentian, you know, you, they'll fade horribly over the years. But they make a pencil now. The, the Derwent has a light fast brand, uh, uh, set now. Faber Castell uh, makes an incredible polychromos pencil that, that I love using. That's the basis of all my colored pencil work is that. And then I usually layer in with the more opaque kind of luminance pencils. It's like painting, you know, it is very similar. You're layer, it's like glazing, you know, you're layering in colors. But um, uh, I, the, I, I find that um, it's, it's just so much more natural to me than painting. Do you have a favorite between the two? Well, I mean, it's like I go and it's, it's good crop rotation because I mean, when I get tired <laughs> of one, I go to the other. But I, I, uh, right now I'm all about painting because I spent a whole year where I was just doing colored pencil work. And I mean, as, as, as much as I love that, and as, as, you know, as much as I think it's really not t as taken seriously as it should be as an art form, because there's a lot of brilliant colored pencil right. artists out there, brilliant. Like, I'm blown away constantly by, like, how did you do that? And people on Instagram with colored pencil. But, uh, but it's not really as accepted, you know, as, as oil painting, which is a shame, because I don't think that's right. If it lasts... And if it has archival quality, it should be it should be absolutely every bit as validated as oil paint, you know. For sure. Are there any mediums that you'd like to explore, but that you haven't had a chance to? Hmm. I, I would like to get better at. Uh, well, I've been trying to do little films. I was going to say I was working on a film uh, with a friend of mine. We were we were trying to put and we wrote a, a screenplay together. It was called The Women of Troy. And it, it featured my, my paintings quite a bit, but um, that's a, that's an, uh, film is, is an, a medium I'd like to get into. But I also have an idea for a children's book. Well, not really a children's book, more of a graphic uh, novel because it's, it's pretty twisted, but I don't think it'd be good for any ch child you know, under, under 20 to read. But um, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I want anything that tells a story, I'm really interested in telling stories. I mean, it's hard because, you know, right now I feel like um, there's a, this explosion of, of artists in, in technical fields, you know, like uh, technology. And uh, that's where, you, you know, you really don't hear a lot of uh, cutting edge work and artists like being as famous as, you know, back in the 60s or 70s because... Um, most of the of of the, the the artists that are really really thinking outside the box are popping up in technology, so um, and you know worked with the, that kind of material. So I I would like to get into more of um, maybe even animation. I don't know. I it probably will never happen because this this is my lot in life, and I'm I, now I'm too <laughs> old to turn corners again. So well, I mean, if you had had that same frame of mind in your 30s when you thought you were too old to change careers, then you never yeah. would have become a painter, right? So <laughs> That's true. That's true. But now, now, now I'm, I'll be 48 in next September. It was such an uphill climb to teach myself oil painting. Like, I mean, it was really kind of curl up in a fetal position in the corner of the room, kind of frustrating. I don't know that I could put myself through that again. You know, you're, you, you're elastic when you're younger, you know? And I was just at the cusp of my elasticity when I started oil painting. So <laughs> I don't know that I could do that again, but. What What is your typical studio practice like? You sort of briefly went over it um, in, in sort of at a high level, but um, what is a typical work day like for you? Well, um, I usually get up at around uh, anywhere from five to eight, depending on how late I was up the night before painting. And um, I just, you know, I have uh, my easel here that I've attached. I just came up with this. I'm so proud of myself because I'd, for years, I'd used a mall stick, and the mall stick is 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 like basically, uh, uh, you know, a soft uh, cushioned uh, at the end of it stick that you lean against the painting to keep a steady hand. That started to really uh, be a problem because it would lift the paint, and it, you know you have to always work left to right. You can't work at any. So I just I thought, well, I'm you know I'm going to try to, you know, make it so that I can move across the surface of the painting and not touch the surface. So I, I screwed on uh, sort of a, a, a two inch wide uh, beam 
against my easel. And then I bought this old guy's walking stick. And I just link the walking stick over the, the, the beam. And then I can just glide across the painting without touching it. So it's the, and someone mentioned to me on Instagram, like, what, it, what, it, what is that old walking stick you have moving? <laughs> I like it's a do-it-yourself mal stick. But that, and I do that and, and I stop. I mean, I, for a while there, um, I was working out uh, at two o'clock in the afternoon. Usually I'd stop to work out. I haven't been doing that lately because I really have to get the show in the can. So it has time to dry and be varnished before, before being shipped off. So right now, um, I've just shut all basic uh, windows to people in my life until I get this finished. And I tell everyone, you're not, you're not going to see me for a few months. Mm. It's just going to be complete work nonstop. Does, does that include weekends? You don't take any weekends off? No, not when I'm, not when I'm doing a solo show. Because for me, I mean, th- these paintings, t- not only do they take forever to do, because I do them in layers, um, and, and there's always elements that I'm adding or taking away up until the last minute. But, you know, I mean, it's, it's, they need that, those months to dry before I can varnish them. So it's like, you really have to think ahead, you know? Yeah, no, for sure. Um, you mentioned meditation earlier and from what I've read, um, that's a big component of like your day-to-day life. Yeah. Um, and, and you've even said before that having a solid meditation practice helps your creativity. Um, when did you start practicing meditation? I started practicing meditation around 2000, I want to say six or seven, around there. But I didn't really get a groove or a, like a, a, a handle on, because everybody's different, right? Everyone has a different approach. Everyone's got a different. I read this uh, book about Zen um, uh, meditation, and there were some breathing techniques that really helped me. And once I started getting a sense of, because of, of, I mean, oh my God, my life completely changed with meditation. When I, st- when I started really getting, getting the hang of it, I, my, my, I mean, my life did a complete 180. There's this great saying in meditation about, you know, it stills the waters. And when the waters are still, you can see right to the bottom. And there, when you're meditating and you get, in, you get aligned, for whatever reason, I don't have the answers. I don't know what, why. But answers to questions come that you never even thought about asking. And just and there's this in crazy sense of clarity. And, you know, I was making it just all of a sudden I was making all the right decisions and I was knowing what to do and where to go. And it, it sort of it cuts out all of the noise. And I think if, if we taught kids to meditate would completely be a paradigm shift and we wouldn't have all these over medicated children, you know, I'm sure there are lots and lots of people who have legitimate uh, chemical imbalances that they, that, that, that need to be corrected. But by and large, I think there's way too many people on, on medication that could probably have much, much better results with, with meditation. Was this part of a, a larger spiritual practice like Buddhism or, or was it? No, no. It was just a sense that I needed to, um, I, I was just so chaotic. And I, you know, like I said before, I had so much anxiety. And I just, I was reading all these books um, about spirituality and stuff. And I mean, I, I, I don't know, I don't have any hard and fast beliefs one way or the other. And I think that's part of being able to have such great meditations because I, I'm not putting all my eggs in any basket. I'm, I, you know, sometimes I think it's really good to just say, I don't know, you know, and just be okay to be in that space of, uh, you know, I don't know why I do this or, or all the secrets of the universe or whatever, but we're not meant to know maybe. So I, I, no, I don't have a spiritual, um, stillness. Stillness is, 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 is my spiritual and art. Art has always been my replacement of religion because I, I didn't grow up in a religious family. My sister is very religious and that's always been sort of a, a kind of a weird friction between us. But um, I don't like any kind of dogma. I cannot be part of any her, kind of herd mentality. It, I just always go the opposite way. You know, I, I, I try to keep all my beliefs very loose, you know, because we don't know. We just don't know. Uh, do you feel like art is meditative for you? Oh God, yeah, absolutely. Oh, for sure, for sure, for sure. I mean, I go into a trance. As a matter of fact, when I when I'm painting, sometimes if I do like a full few days of painting where it's like I do nothing else, someone tries to talk to me, and I 
really lose the ability to communicate properly. <laughs> you know, I lose my articulation. You know, it's like when you've been like watching TV for a long time and you try to talk to somebody after that, you, you just don't have the same facility with words, you know? So it's like that part of your brain, you know, if you don't keep it greased, it's not going to work properly. But when, I, when, I, when I'm painting, it's just synapses firing. Like it's just very intuitive, you know, visually intuitive. And it's like playing a video game kind of, I suppose, you know, it's that same kind of muscle. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk a bit about your move to Wallaceburg. So uh, a, a little more than a year ago, you moved from Toronto. So it's considerably closer to where you were born in Chatham, yeah. right? What prompted the move from Toronto? Well, uh, I've always been looking for a property that was sort of part art gallery studio with a loft. And I found this place. And I mean, I didn't even know it was in Wallaceburg. I, I honestly, my partner and I just typed in New York style loft. Mm. And this was like one of the first places that came up. And we're looking at it, I swear to you, before I even look to see, because the, the great thing is, I am you know, an artist, I can live anywhere. Chris, my partner, is a flight director for Air Canada. He can work anywhere as long as we have access to a, an airport. So we have this fantastic um, you know, position where we can kind of go wherever we want. So we were looking in Montreal, we were looking in, in everywhere, you know. And this place came up, and before I even looked to see where it was, I was on the phone with the agent. And Chris said, oh my God, this is on the same street as your father. Oh, wow. <laughs> I was like, what? Not only in the same town, it's the same street. Wow. And I mean, I, I guess I, I didn't really remember driving past it, but it's an old converted bank. And the people that lived here before... Uh, he was a photographer. His wife was a stained glass artist. They beautifully, like, I mean, they did such a great job with this building, the, the, the exposed brick. I mean, it looks like a proper gallery. When I, I mean, when I came in, I actually, I installed some really great track lighting for the gallery part. And it's just this, I mean, I, I every time, and there's a gigantic three bedroom loft upstairs for a price that was incredibly affordable because it's not in downtown Toronto. Only two CEOs can afford to live, you know, in a loft in Toronto. So it was just a perfect thing. And I, it just an added bonus that my dad was down the street because, you know, I just can go over and have coffee with him anytime I want, which is a dream. That's awesome to be so close to your family again. Oh, I love it. Yeah. And it's appropriately called the vault when, and I can see a safe in the background, which is incredible. <laughs> oh, you can see the safe guts. Yeah. 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 There's like, there's, well, there's, there's that safe. There's actually um, a safe downstairs. There's a safe in inside the gallery and sort of, there's a gigantic, uh, you know, wrought iron door that leads into another safe. And that safe has never been opened. Not for like 70 years. The people that lived here before, they don't even know what's in that safe. So one of these days we're going to have to come over and have a safe cracking party, you know, have some champagne. In addition to serving as a studio, are you wanting to do more with it? Like maybe host a show or anything like that? You know, when I, when I originally uh, took over this place, I thought, wouldn't it be great to make it a gallery? And, but then I started working and I thought, well, that's, that can't happen because, I mean, you know, painting is so time consuming and I can't have people coming through here. So I figured, you know, I, I'm just going to uh, have this be, you know, a studio gallery that if people want to come and view my work, then, you know, then that's what, that's what we'll do. But as of right now, it's, it's, um, it's just going to be a by invitation only kind of thing. Okay. You mentioned your, your solo show and I want to talk, uh, you know, a bit about that. So I, I saw either yesterday or the day before it actually has a title now through a glass darkly. Yes. Um, and it's opening August 22nd at Corey Helford. You've described it as a film noir in oil paint. Yes. Um, what, what can you tell us about the show? Well, this is so funny because I just had an actually a discussion with the gallery um, just yesterday because I, I, I had planned to do a series called Bloom. And it was going to be, you know, the summer, last summer I was in this mood where I was like, you know, Wallaceburg really comes alive in the summer and it's so beautiful. I live right on the water. And I just thought I want to do a series with things that are about spring and, and have it pinks and peonies and, 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 and foliage and all this stuff. 
And then I broke my foot. Oh. It was Friday the 13th in September. And I broke my foot. And all of a sudden, it just was like, it changed my whole perspective. I, I, I couldn't go to work. I was stuck upstairs. I started watching all of my favorite movies on my iPad. You know, all these great film noirs, like, you know, Double Indemnity and, and, and Mildred Pierce and my favorite, favorite film noir, which is a 1947 Warner Brothers movie called Possessed, which is my all-time favorite. And it just put me in this space where I just thought, oh, God, I wanted... I've always had my big toe sort of stuck in the pool of film noir. I thought I should really just do a, a full-on deep dive into film noir because it really kind of is a summation of my work, you know? For sure, yeah. And uh, everyone that talks about my work always mentions sort of film noir in it. So anyway, so I, I decided to do that. And then I forgot that I really hadn't mentioned that to the gallery. <laughs> Coriolver Gallery was still expecting, you know, these paintings of pinks and blues and, and <laughs> you know, and they had, and so I had, I had told people that I was going to do this series for Corey Helford Gallery. And I had done this painting called Bloom. It was a little tall, tiny painting. And I guess there was a quite a reaction to that painting and, and they'd had a lot of interest in it. So when I called them yesterday, <laughs> Or sent them. I sent them a bunch of pictures of some of the work, and they were just in a panic. And they're like, "This isn't what you said." And I'm like, "Oh shit!" So you know, we we they're fine with it. I think it was just a shock because it was the absolute polar opposite of what I I had promised them. And I guess I I, I thought I guess I should have told you this a little sooner. But <laughs> anyway, but I think it's I I personally think it's some of my best work. And you know, I I was talking about this to to, to Chris today. I, I think in the back of my head, I felt like that whole series bloom, it would have been great for like three or four paintings, but I need more of a substantial kind of um, uh, uh, theme for a series of paintings. There needs to be more meat on the bones. And, and the idea of doing a film noir set to oil paint was just more meatier for me. Yeah, for sure. How many pieces do you think there will be? Twelve. There's twelve. I'm half, well, I'm halfway. Uh, more than halfway finished. So they're, they're, all the paintings have been started. I'm just sort of in a race against time to finish them all before April comes. Is that, is that your goal to wrap it up and so it has time to dry? Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, I do very thin layers, very, very tiny, thin layers. So it's not like I'm doing big, cloppy, impasto stuff. So there's, it doesn't take like, you know, like a year or anything to dry. It's usually pretty dry in a couple months. So. Yeah, as long as I have that time. But they need to be varnished because any kind, anytime you do a painting in dark colors, there needs to be a varnish. I mean, with, with paler paintings, you can get away with not varnishing them, you know, because they look great matte and stuff. But with the dark paintings, you see all the different finishes of the oil paint. You know, some dark paint is really shiny. Some is really matte. You've got to unify that finish. So varnish, you cannot escape varnishing with the darker colors. Is that something you've always done with your work? No, I never, I never used to varnish, but as I get more comfortable with the process, I mean, you know, I've had, I've had some varnishing nightmares and I'm terrified to do it. I remember I, you know, I learned the hard, like I said, I'm, since I'm basically teaching myself all these things, and I mean, I take tutorials here and there, but you really can only learn really by trial and error. That's my, that's the only way that I ever learn. So I remember I painted uh, these paintings that I was going to send off to New York, and then I varnished them. But I didn't realize, uh, I had always had the air conditioning going full blast in my studio, but I didn't realize, even if you have the air conditioning going full blast, if it's humid outside, it's humid inside. So I varnished these paintings, and all of these tiny white bubbles started appearing oh. and i thought oh shit so then i started taking a pin and i'm like frantically oh. trying to pop these bubbles and then but it, it, i could i had to repaint the whole thing so those are the kinds of you know things that you that, that what i said before about you it just puts you in a fetal position in the corner it can really break your heart when something like that happens for sure all right well we're getting to the end now so uh where can people find you online um uh troybrooks.com and um instagram is official troy brooks yeah awesome so one last question and it's something that i ask everybody 
Uh, who is one artist that you'd like to see me have on the show? Oh, um, oh, you know who is one of my favorite, favorite artists is Johnson Sang. Do you know who that is? No, I, I'd have to look him up. I think he's um, uh, an Asian sculptor, and he does these um, incredible sculptures of, you know, those, you, you've seen like the babies that what their heads are kind of exploding into milk. I just think he is one of the most brilliant artists I've ever seen. You know, his ideas are so inventive. And every time I see something by him, it blows me away. I've never been disappointed by him. So he's someone who's really great. Awesome. I'll have to take his name down and look him up. That sounds really cool. Yeah. Well, Troy, thanks a ton for coming on the show. It's been a real treat chatting with you. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. So that's it for this episode of Art Affairs. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Troy. I really found Troy's story interesting. He's been making art since before he even really knew language. And in effect, art and artistic expression uh, was really his first language, with English being his second. And because of that, throughout his entire life, he's used art as a way of telling stories about himself even if that wasn't obvious to him as it was happening. It seemed more like a subconscious thing, uh, expressing what he couldn't very well articulate in words. Uh, He was able to communicate through art using symbols and metaphor, telling stories about these strong, powerful women that demanded respect and were actually little vignettes about his own life and experience. Surrealist self-portraits in a way. Troy's new body of work, Through a Glass Darkly, sounds like it's going to be incredible. I'm definitely excited to see the final product in August. Again, that show opens on the 22nd of August at Corey Helford Gallery. So thanks again to Troy for joining me today, and thank you for checking out the show. I'm truly grateful for your support. Feel free to shoot me an email if you have any suggestions for the show, or if there's a guest you want me to try and have on. I'd love to hear any feedback you might have for me. You can contact me through my website at artaffairspodcast.com. And like I said at the front of the show, you can go there to check out any previous episodes. You can also find the show on Instagram and Facebook at Art Affairs Podcast. And last but not least, if you're on Apple Podcasts, I'd really appreciate it if you took a moment to rate and review the show. And of course, tell all your friends on social media about it too. It's a wonderful way to help get the word out. So until next time... Be good to yourself and be good to each other.